You all are very nice. <laughs> it is lovely to see so many people. Thank you. Wyatt, where are you? There you are. Thank you, darling. But thank you to the staff, always. But thank you to all of my friends here. I've got a whole lot of friends here, and I am grateful for that fact. I'm going to read something that is sort of um, painfully new. This is so new that it, uh, these are the opening pages of a novel that does not yet have a title. Jack Allette died on January 14th on a footpath that went around the condominium complex where he lived with his, life, with his wife, Linda. While he jogged at a pace that ought to have embarrassed him, an aneurysm bloomed in his brain. The doctor said later that he had lost consciousness before he hit the wood chip covered trail. When the next jogger found him, there was a half smile on Jack's face, and Linda comforted herself with that. At least his last thought had brought him some pleasure. Linda was not usually sentimental. She knew as well as anyone that a face can twist with sudden shock and that half turned up lips didn't necessarily indicate happiness. But she was new to being a widow and allowed to grasp at whatever comfort she could find. She explained this to her reflection in the bathroom mirror and her reflection nodded back at her. She and the reflection had been drinking a little. That was comfort too, obviously. When she came home from the hospital, she washed her face. Mourners, she supposed, would call on her, bringing food and flowers and the time-worn expressions of sympathy. She waited, but apparently that wasn't how grief was conducted anymore. Some phone calls blinked onto the answering machine, and emails popped into her inbox, but the refrigerator still held only the Christmas leftovers and a, ha and a half gallon of milk. The evening after Jack died, Linda stood in front of the open refrigerator and tried to imagine fixing herself a ham sandwich, or a plate of leftover corn casserole. Eating the food she'd last shared with Jack was unbearable, so she sat at the kitchen table and started to make a shopping list. Milk. That was as far as she got before she vomited, slipped to the floor, and cried in an easy, even, steady rhythm as if she was pacing herself for the long haul. Staying curled on the floor under the table was a teenager's idea of grief, but going upstairs to the bed she'd shared with Jack for 22 years was unthinkable, so she stayed on the floor until she could come up with another place to go. The house was filled with small noises, the refrigerator cycling on and off, its ice machine jamming, her computer chiming when another email arrived, the wind slipping past the window. Linda wondered whether she would be condemned to hear these sounds for the rest of her life. She pulled her sweater up higher on her neck, suddenly cold, and wondered how long she would have to stay on the floor before she came to her senses and moved to the couch. Three hours. Nothing had prepared her for this. She would say that over and over to the friends who called once word finally got out and to the mourners gathered at the memorial service held at the funeral home. The gathering was orchestrated by the funeral director assigned to her, a kind woman who didn't understand the first thing about Linda or Jack and who started the service by cueing Handel's Largo. Jack would have wanted when the saints come marching in, something that Linda didn't remember until months after the funeral. She didn't remember a lot of things. The days around Jack's sudden death were mostly obliterated. Linda didn't realize how much a mercy this was until memory started muscling back in again, bullying her into remembering the milk gone to cheese in the refrigerator, stacks of condolence cards sitting unanswered on her desk, the water from floral arrangements finally getting so rank she could smell it all the way in the guest room where she slept now, sometimes for 15 hours at a stretch. Beyond the door of the guest room, beyond the front door of the house, a world waited and it was full of impatient expectations for her. Bills, Jack's estate. Somehow Linda had managed the most essential chores while her memory was still AWOL. Apparently the self-preservation instinct was the vestigial ability to write checks to mortgage and power companies. Now she made lists. She should get a dog. She should get a job. She should go through Jack's closet. Each of those actions felt exactly the same as the others, smooth beads slipping over her fingertips. So far, what she'd managed was late night trips to the 7-Eleven. She was staying alive on slushies. This was exactly the time in the story when someone should enter her life, and someone did. Jack's secretary, Isabel. She had worked with Jack for almost 20 years at Easy and Elegant, arranging receptions and social functions for companies up and down the West Coast. Linda couldn't count the evenings she and Isabel had stood with glasses of mediocre champagne, filling out the room for some small company's reception or birthday or gala. Linda and Isabel circulated, making conversation with men capable of looking at them and saying, I'd like you to handle my affairs. Linda and Isabel weren't friends, but they were comrades, battle-hardened. 
Isabel had stayed through the bad years for Easy and Elegant, and Linda knew that Jack would be grateful for that. Now she came to visit Linda, and Linda was suddenly stingingly aware of her hair, dangling uncolored and unstyled and not well enough washed down her back. Isabel looked, as always, as if she had just stepped out of the pages of a book on dressing for success. What are we going to do now, said Isabel. We, said Linda. <laughs> Isabel didn't hear about Jack's death until two, two hours before the funeral. She was taking a week's vacation to paint her condo and had given the office staff instructions not to contact her for any reason. What if something important comes up, said Star, the new boy who worried about things. Figure out what to do. This is how you learn, Isabel said. But if anything goes wrong, I'll be blamed, Star said. Bingo. <laughs> Isabel danced out of the office as if she were going to Tahiti instead of facing a week with drop cloths and rollers. This was a good time for her absence to remind Jack how much the office needed her. He had been a little too casual about her lately. That feeling, along with the bedroom walls that had never recovered from a sponge treatment that had left the walls looking diseased, made it easy for her to decide how to use her vacation time. At night, she would order in fatty food she rarely let herself eat, pizza and pot stickers, and she gave herself an unlimited liquor license. By the time she came back to work, she would have the slightly plump, slightly indolent look of someone who's had a real vacation. Isabel didn't subscribe to a newspaper, and even if she had, she wouldn't have read the obituaries. She wasn't that old yet. She was on a stepladder, cutting in the ceiling with a color called vinegar, when her phone rang. Cheered to see the caller ID showing easy and elegant, she let the call go to voicemail. Even then, she might have missed the message, except that she had to get down from the ladder to pee, and something urged her to check the message, if only for the glee of hearing the office scramble without her. Isabel, I hope you get this. You need to know. Jack died three days ago. His funeral is this afternoon at McAlder's. It was very sudden. I think you want to know. Star thought so, did he? Isabel pressed replay to make sure she'd heard everything right, then hit delete. She would regret that later. It was one thread, however flimsy, that had tied her to a world with Jack in it. A long time passed since they had been lovers. When Isabel first came to the company, its downhill tilt had already started. What am I doing wrong, Jack said after another failed pitch in his office, his voice practically a howl. They don't want us to be sold a party where they don't imagine they'd be enjoying themselves. I should lose the string quartet, he said. What do you think those guys really want at the end of a day, she said. Secure, she kept staring at him while he stretched out the moment. There wasn't a thing wrong with what they were doing, two people talking right in the middle of the office where anybody could walk by and see, though no one had walked by. There weren't a lot of employees. No string quartet, he said slowly. Fun, but not fun that will get anybody in trouble. Give them, give them themes, she said. We could do tropical, with a banana leaf skirt around the table and umbrella drinks. Be serious. I am serious. You can make good hors d'oeuvres with mango and pork. Well, hell, he said, finally pulling back from her. Might as well. It's not like people are busting the doors for us to get in right now. After that, she felt him watch her. She wore sexy, insanely painful shoes to work, shoes with needle-thin heels and low-cut toes. The day after he didn't get another party account, a fat one for an accounting firm, she stopped at an Asian grocery on her way to work, then teetered into his office and left a banana leaf on his blotter. Did you clear this with payroll, he said, fingering the fleshy leaf. I am payroll. If this works and we get the next contract, what do you want? Isabel smiled and waited until Jack looked from the banana leaf up to her. You tell me, he said. His smile was rueful, not excited. Uh, oh, sorry, Isabel smiled and waited until Jack looked uh, up from the banana leaf to her. You tell me, she said. His smile was rueful, not excited. A very nice dinner in Nevada, he said. So you're going to go receipt and research the Vegas theme? I hope not, he said. He was as good as his word. After the Tahiti-themed reception for sweet treats, when the cash bar did land office business on pina coladas that she had insisted on, he flew her to McCarran and met her outside the baggage claim. Where does Linda think you are? She didn't intend to be the kind of mistress who pretended the wife didn't exist. Las Vegas. Doesn't she wonder why she's not here? She hates Las Vegas. So do I. Then why are you here if not to see the sights? I am not here to see the sights. Just like that, his voice roughened and his eyes flared. Even on the small plane ride from Burbank, Isabel had not quite believed that she and Jack were starting anything. 
His behavior at the office had remained graceful and elusive, and he seemed to see the Vegas trip as part of a debt he had to discharge. Only on the loud, crowded sidewalk outside the airport, the air white and superheated as a spotlight, did he let Isabel glimpse hunger. Let's go, she said. It was as long a sentence as she could manage. For the next eight months, they met out of town, in Las Vegas twice more, in San Diego, a ridiculous weekend in Boise, in Portland. Between trips in the office, they worked with perfect decorum, Isabel buzzing Jack's office before she materialized in the doorway, Jack nodding at her almost curtly before he left the office for the day. She had thought she would hate such pretense, but the subterfuge was sexy, with every word not said hovering above the few that were. Outside the office, in one of the nice hotels Jack always found for them, they boiled over with pent-up, feverish hunger. Once, Jack, kissing her in an elevator, groped to hit the emergency stop button, pinning her against the felt-covered wall until the system's automatic alarm came on and the fire department was dispatched. <laughs> Isabel started to straighten her hair and skirt as the elevator was re-enabled, but Jack held, her down, held down her hands so that she emerged from the elevator with her hair flying away from her face and her blouse hanging off one shoulder. Jesus, she heard a fireman mutter. Despite Isabel's resolution, they did not talk about Linda. No hotel room was big enough to hold both their affair and Jack's marriage, or the fact that Isabel was not married, had never been married, was 38 years old and making, at the company owned by her lover, $40,000 a year. Once, when Isabel had zipped closed her suitcase, she watched Jack tying his shoes. Abruptly, desire for him swelled in her again, even, through the sh even though the sheets, mostly torn from the bed, still held some of their heat. Let's stay one more day, she said. He shook his head. Can't. Why not? It's Linda's birthday. He started tying his shoe again, eyes firm, fixed firmly on his feet. How old is she? 34. This is a hard birthday for her. She says that she feels like doors are closing on her life. 34. That's not so old. She's making jokes about walkers. She looks like the breath of spring. Tell her I said so. From the ceiling came the thrum of someone's shower being turned on above them. Despite this hotel's pretensions of grandeur, Isabel and Jack had been offered champagne when they checked in. It really was kind of shoddy. What did you get her? A diamond bracelet. So we'd better get that Foster and Murphy account, she said. I'd like you to call them first thing tomorrow. I'll be sure to do that. He had the decency to leave the room and rummage noisily in the bathroom, where they had left nothing, while she collected herself. When he came back, she was looking out the big window on the courtyard that was dominated by a gigantic fountain. The water was recycled, but it was still a fantastic thing to see in the sun's hot glare. From somewhere unseen, Vegas style, a fan sometimes blew across the top of the ribbon of water, making it shatter into pretty fragments. Jack rested his hands on Isabel's shoulders. I was thinking about showing the bracelet to you before I got it for Linda, but I didn't think you'd like that. Was I right? Go with your instincts, Isabel said. The following Monday, she came back to work wearing the bottle green pumps that made her legs look their best and the blouse with the lowest neckline she would wear in an office. Jack wolf whistled when he saw her, and then said, Direct Fresh Produce has been calling. Can you find out what they want? They wanted a contract, which Isabel recommended after she drove down their offering price by 12%. Jack didn't give her a promotion, but he gave her a raise. For the first several months, Isabel swore she would leave the company, but Jack made it easy to stay. He flirted with her more in the office than he had ever done when they were lovers. Whenever, whatever Isabel felt about him, she didn't feel overlooked. Praising her efficiency and creativity, Jack kept finding reasons to add an extra 50 or $100 to her paycheck. A person learns to live with things. Another job would have been hard to find and wouldn't have allowed her so much creative leeway. And she'd never told anyone about Jack. The affair had only gone on a few months, not even a year. She had thought there would be plenty of time to tell people and then it was over, and there was nothing left to tell. She allowed herself to remember the affair once, maybe twice a year, otherwise building firewalls against the memory. She firmly turned off the radio if a song came on that reminded her of him, and she didn't let herself watch TV shows that she knew he liked, and she threw away the clothes he had taken off of her. This way, the memory could still come upon her like a shock, how tears had come to her eyes when he wound up his hand tight in her hair and would not let go. Mitch Reynolds did his best to help Linda out after Jack died, finding quiet ways to make her days a little easier. 
He picked up her newspaper from the driveway and set it on her welcome mat in the morning and used a day she was out of the house to fertilize the shrubs around her front walk. He looked for tasks that she wouldn't notice. He didn't want her to feel beholden to a man who made her uncomfortable. Mitch's condo was three doors down from Linda's and had the same scribble of ivy going up the garage wall. He and Jack had been beer and football friends for nearly a year before Mitch admitted to once having been a minister. It was like telling people that he was a jailbird. Conversation shriveled like a salted slug as soon as he said church. But Jack was intrigued by Mitch's old life, and he started by showing up at, and he started showing up at Mitch's place more often, sometimes with a six-pack six right before kickoff. So what do you think, Jack asked, gesturing at the TV screen. Is everything all planned out? Does God already know the end of the football game? Imagine how boring that would be for God, Mitch said. Nothing but what you already know, forever. Then what do those people mean who insist that God has a plan? What's the plan? Dunno. They're a lot more sure of themselves than I am. That's why I got out. Jack cracked his sharp smile. It was impossible not to warm to the man, and, and Mitch thought, before squashing the thought, that Jack would have been indispensable on parish council. Jack said, I'd like to think there's a plan. It would be comforting on a cold night. Everybody wants to think that, Mitch said, a little more ferociously than he'd meant to. He was on his fifth beer. Jack was a smart guy, capable of seeing several sides of an issue. He had real questions about God, about the nature of good and evil, about free will. He wanted to know what Mitch thought and wasn't attempting to get justification for whatever indiscretion he was already dead set on committing. He would have made a good minister, better than Mitch. But Mitch was tired of being the answer man. He was sick of the swimmy look in people's eyes when they asked about the afterlife or God's will. 20 years in the ministry, the young years, years he'd give a lot to have back, had taught him that he didn't know the first thing about God's will. He should have learned his lesson quicker, but he had been very sure about God when he was 21. Thinking about his young self made Mitch tired, and he wished someone had come along to shut that self-confident little shit up. Now that Mitch was, as he put it, a civilian, he thought, that his, he thought that his young self presented a good argument against the existence of God, since if Mitch were God and he'd had to listen to young Mitch all the time, he would have smote him just to get some rest. <laughs> when Mitch was in his first church in Indio, close enough to Palm Springs to share its weather but not its wealth, one of the parishioners had killed himself, leaving behind four children, a wife, and unexpectedly, a pot of money. No one knew where it came from. This is the only way I can be any use to you, read his note. What does he mean, use, said his widow, talking in a monotone. She and Mitch were sitting in her living room where the shades were drawn. Outside, the temperature was 103. Inside, Mitch guessed, it was 103. The child who had let him in had whispered something about the air conditioning. Does he mean that I used him? I'm the one who gave birth to his four children. He was a sad man, troubled, Mitch said. If only he had looked up, we could have saved him. But he didn't look up. Neither did his wife. I have no idea what to do. I don't know what direction to go. My daughter may, had to make me coffee this morning. My daughter, she's seven. God will help you raise her. Well, that's good. I'm gonna need the help. Is God going to go to her soccer games? The drops on her face were sweat, not tears. Her face went up again and again to wipe them away, regular as a metronome. Mitch's vision was blurred from the heat and he gripped the chair to keep himself upright. It would look bad for the minister to pass out. What would you like people to remember about him, Mitch said. He'd shaken the man's hand after service, but had never had a conversation with him. The obituary had said he managed a Firestone dealership, which wasn't much to go on. I think we already know. They're going to remember a shotgun and a car with a hose going to the tailpipe. A spasm crossed her face, and then she was impassive again. He had four children, Mitch said. He was a family man, a good father to his children. He provided for you. Yes, he did that. Maybe we'll buy a Rolls Royce. This is a time of upheaval and uncertainty for you. It's a good time to turn to God. Okay, tell me which way to turn, she said. You just have to believe. All the help you need will come if you believe. The force of heat in the room was unbelievable. Mitch felt as if he were slowly suffocating. A miserable minute passed before she looked up again, her finely shaped finger wiping her cheek. Thank you for coming, Reverend. Would you like me to pray with you? Not now. The answer on her chalky, downcast face was clear. Not ever. Get out of my house. No offense, but I really don't see the point. He chuckled, an awful sound, like a department store Santa Claus in August trying to stay in shape. You can't stop me from praying for you to be helped in this hard time. 
Through a trick of the shadowy room, her face seemed to get even whiter. My husband made sure he could help me from beyond the grave. I don't think I can stand any more help. Mitch made that horrible chuckle again and let her all but push him out the door. Four months later, she left town with money, taking her two youngest children. Recalling the conversation now, Mitch's body burned with embarrassment. He wished he could have a do-over to sit with the woman and let her talk about anything she wanted, her TV shows or the kids' school or anything. He wouldn't mention prayer or God. He wouldn't pretend he knew a damn thing about why a 43-year-old man would kill himself and leave his family $300,000 that they'd never guessed at and that seemed pretty shady. He would have made arrangements to get her air conditioner fixed. Well, everybody started out young and stupid, and Mitch was probably not any worse a minister than anybody else. There had been good times, too, parishes, parishes he'd loved, friends scattered now all over the country. At Christmas time, his mail baskets overflowed with cards from people he'd loved once, even if now he had to frown at the cards before he remembered who had signed them with such breezy affection. Less affectionate were the cards from people who remembered Suzanne, his wife. He had married her when she was 19 and he was 27, late by minister standards. In the choir, her rich, sweet soprano that had made up for the rest of the section, median age 60, every one of them still convinced they could hit the high note and how great they are, thou art, had sailed and made him happy. I lost the sentence, sorry. Mitch had loved to listen to her voice sail confidently over the others. Later, he would love to hear her cries in bed, a full octave lower. He teased her that she sounded like a man until she made it clear that she didn't like that joke. <laughs> Because she had a tattoo of a beehive on the back of her neck and she, still, and she wore a ring with a skull on it, he had thought she was wild, the kind of wild girl who still went to church on Sundays, a combination that made him breathe harder. He needed a wife. His parish assignments had started to get worse, smaller churches in more and more rural areas where the church buildings were falling apart and the parsonages were shacks. It would help if you were married, his bishop had told him. Why is it that you're not? Is there something you want to talk about? Just haven't found the right girl, Mitch said. Congregations like a married pastor. He can relate to them, and the wife can be a big help in running the parish. Tell me about it, Mitch said. There's nothing you want to tell me, the bishop said more sharply, and Mitch shook his head. I don't want to read about you in the paper. So he married Suzanne in a nice ceremony with the bishop presiding. She wore flowers in her hair, and he called her his hippie bride, another thing she told him later that she didn't like. It wasn't long before the fights started, scorchers that were all the more vicious because Mitch and Suzanne had to whisper their accusations and reproaches. The parsonage was a trailer so flimsy and so close to the sidewalk that anyone strolling past could hear a cupboard door slammed. They stopped fighting when she got pregnant, the news coming three years to the day after they exchanged vows. Suzanne had stopped leaving the parsonage at all, moodily reading about every barren wife in the Bible until Mitch, trying to be nice, told her that she wasn't exactly Sarah, 90 years old, when she finally conceived a son. No kidding, Suzanne said, you're no Moses. <laughs> they waited until Suzanne was, not, was three months along before Mitch made the happy announcement from the pulpit when he chalked up the glances and raised eyebrows to this plain bit of evidence that their pastor had sex. After the service, he stood in the door of the church, accepting embarrassed congratulations and trying not to be hurt by the parishioners who found ways to sidle past him without meeting his eyes. I didn't think they'd be so prissy, he said later to Suzanne over lasagna from the freezer. They're all a bunch of little old ladies who can't believe anybody else has a life, she said. They watch each other's every move as if somebody might actually do something interesting, and then they talk. Did you see? Marlene went to the store and bought two different kinds of cheese. Did you ever hear of such a thing? They're not that bad, he said, laughing to prove that he was on her side. You don't know. They're always nice and Christian around you. Get them together in a room and you'll see a different face. Bunch of harpies. He would have liked to shut her words away, but they infected him. He started to notice the way his parishioners looked uneasy when he spoke to them. When he made fond reference to his growing family, people changed the subject. Almost a month passed before the letter arrived, unsigned, tucked under one corner of the welcome mat at the parsonage. Ask your wife about Edward Morey. Emotion and thought dropped away. His brain seemed to freeze. He didn't wake Suzanne up, but he laid the note on her side of the table, then clattered through making coffee and pouring cereal. She was still asleep when he had to go to church. When he got home, the note was gone. By then, he'd had plenty of time to do an internet search of Edward Morey, who taught at the local community college and had good rankings on RateMyProfessors.com. <laughs> Is there anything to tell me, he said to Suzanne? The same thing I've been telling you. Every member of this church is a busybody who thinks she's seeing the young and the restless every time she steps out her front door. So you know him? Yes. How? I met him at the grocery store. 
Her face was tilted slightly away from him. Maybe it was a cast of the light, but the turn of her mouth looked smug. Damn it, Suzanne, look at me. In those days, that was the most cursing he did. She shrugged. It's true. He asked me how to tell an avocado is ripe. I told him to look for a soft one. And why is there a note linking your name with his on the doorstep of our house? Because ministers' wives aren't allowed to talk to strange men in grocery stores. The freeze that had settled in his brain thickened until he was so cold that his skin prickled and his hands started to shake. That's right, he said. They're not. What other conversations have you had with him? None. You never talked to him again, but you know his name? This is not a big town. People don't wear name tags. She sighed. He asked about the avocados. He asked what I do, and I told him I was married to you. He told me his name. I told him my name. We shook hands. He bought three avocados. I made him put one back because it was too hard. That's everything I can tell you. He could see that she was angry. Well, he was angry too. But he could also see the tears rimming the edges of her closed eyes and the way her mouth trembled. I'm sorry this happened, he said. Me too. I'm sorry you were the target of gossip. I'll preach about that. I wish you would. Bunch of harpies, he said, watching carefully. She didn't react. He put the incident away then. He had plenty of evidence of his own to prove that people talked about one another, watched, and made accusations. His wife was telling the truth. The next day, he went to the college and drove around the parking lots, wondering which car was Edward Morey's. One item at a time, as if he were working down a checklist, he did everything he shouldn't. He found Edward Morey's teaching schedule and lingered outside his classroom door. He found out where Edward Morey lived and drove past his house, a shabby bungalow with a metal awning over the porch. It was nicer than the parsonage. Easy to imagine that door swinging open and Edward Morey, unimpressive, big nose face topped off by a magnificent crest of hair Mitch had seen from his faculty link, inviting a person to come in, inviting a girl with a beehive tattoo to come in, inviting a girl who was now pregnant. In the end, he didn't need a face-off with Edward Morey or even Suzanne. He needed a sperm bank. It was no secret that a number of his parishioners were sperm donors as well as plasma donors. The economy was bad and bodily fluids were cheap. When Hector Lindaden came to the church office and whispered that he, need, that he had to see the pastor right away, Mitch was relieved that all Hector needed was a ride to the donation center. This is good of you, man. I appreciate it. I know sperm banks aren't really your thing. I don't know if they are or they aren't. I've never been to one. You should think about it. You don't get paid much, right? It's a way to stretch the paycheck. I don't think it's exactly something I should be doing, Mitch said. People don't want to run into their pastor at the sperm donation center. <laughs> Why not, Hector said. Mitch snorted. It's not what they, think, they want to think about him doing. But it's good enough for the rest of us, right? Mitch had the sense to shut up then and keep driving, turning when Hector directed him until they pulled up to a low building that looked like a converted real estate office. Inside the waiting room, the TV on the wall set to CNN and Men's Health and Newsweek on the side tables. Hector strode to the receptionist's window and came back with a piece of paper that he gave Mitch. I don't think so, Mitch said, glancing at the new donor information at the top of the page. I'm just your taxi service. You so well said in that church you couldn't use an extra $35 a pop? We're getting by. And you're not about to lower yourself to beat off for money like the little people. I'm not judging you, Hector, Mitch said. I brought you here, but I need to think about my choices in a different way. Because what I do doesn't matter like what the Reverend does. Hector Lindaden, he can't hold a job. He might as well go to the sperm bank, sperm bank and jack off. The Reverend is too fine to touch himself. Hector might have been high. It wouldn't be the first time. But he was keeping a steady glare focused on Mitch, his eyes small and clear. None of this is appropriate or fair, Mitch said. My, my mother goes to church. I hear what you say. The Reverend told us that God meets us in the marketplace, she said, like she expected me to go out and get a job at Safeway. They haven't been hiring for two years. I know that. Do you, Reverend? You're making me sound like I'm rich. Hector, I am not rich. Still, you're telling people how to act when you don't really know what they're going through. It's not my job to go through every possible experience. Nobody can do that. But I listen and watch and pay attention. I have my own trials, you know, Mitch said. And I hear about yours, believe me. But if you want to prove that you, like, that you are like one of the people that gets preached to every Sunday, then fill out that form and jack off into a cup, just to prove to me that you can. What are you asking? Am I supposed to prove that I'm a man? Of the people. You're a man of the people, Reverend. <laughs> Mitch was trembling now himself. Anger, maybe, or frustration. Hector had sat back into the hard couch and watched Mitch with an openly mocking smile. 
Of course, Mitch could have walked out and left Hector there in the cryo services tissue bank waiting room. After, after fulfilling his obligation, Hector could walk the 20 miles back home with Mitch's blessing. But word would get around and Mitch couldn't take many more words. So when the receptionist called his name, Hector must have given it to him. Mitch grabbed the paper and marched toward the open door, pretending not to hear Hector say, enjoy yourself, Reverend. <laughs> Events unfurled so quickly then that Mitch felt caught in a smooth, muscular current. The aide act as, acted as if ministers came into a sperm bank all the time. Mitch was directed to a room with a low couch, a TV, soft lighting, and music. On the wall were two photos of women. One gazed down at her breast while she idly sucked her finger. The other, whose dark curly hair spilled over her shoulders, arched her back so that her ass looked as tight and delectable as a peach. Mitch couldn't, kill, keep, couldn't keep himself from feeling stirred, which was embarrassing, even in a place where arousal was the whole point. A stack of maxims, some of them new, sat next to the couch, and the attendant handed Mitch a remote control for the TV. There's a movie already queued up, if you like that. Thanks. Take your time, the attendant said, handing him a plastic sample cup. My name's Mark. Just let me know when you're ready. Mitch and Suzanne hadn't had Congress in some time. In the last week or two, he'd barely touched her. Looking at the brunette with the ass on the wall, he ejaculated so fast, he waited several minutes before calling Mark. <laughs> The phone call came a week later. The receptionist was professional and kind in relaying the news that the lab would not be able to use Mitch as a donor. By this time, Mitch had thought a number of a number of ways to use a $35 donor payment that could be given as often as twice a week, according to the pamphlet he'd brought home. Why not, he said. You might want to make an appointment with your primary care physician. It sounds like something's wrong. Not wrong, no. You have low sperm motility. There could be a number of causes for that, and you might want to come back to us later. But since women use our services in order to become pregnant, we need to make sure our donors have viable sperm. Mitch's vision was spinning, and he steadied himself against the side of the desk. He had enough self-regard left not to ask the representative to repeat himself, but within seconds of hanging up, he was on the Internet. Yes, it was possible for a man with sperm like his to impregnate a woman. Similarly, it was possible for a virgin to find herself pregnant, only to be reassured by the appearance of an angel. For a year or so after his divorce, filed unfinished before the child Jonah turned one, Mitch thought of his trip to the sperm bank as the action of grace, God taking him by the hand and showing him the truth. Later, he thought of it as one more humiliation on his march through his 20s and 30s as he struggled to express and defend the actions of a God he found less and less defensible. His low sperm count was a bad joke, but what was he supposed to say when a woman endured five miscarriages before she brought a little boy to term, only to watch him stop breathing in her arms two weeks after the delivery? Maybe some minister could find a lesson of grace in that, but Mitch couldn't. He had a choice. He could believe in a God who was a sadist, or he could below believe in no God. He chose none. He found work in social services, working first for an education agency and then for, for family protective services. Turned out there were a lot of ex-ministers working in these shabby offices. If the seminary was good for anything, it was good for cranking out workers with honed empathic skills who knew how to file paperwork on time. When he finally got tired of making $30,000 a year, he went back to school and got a master's degree in social work, then took a job managing the community center where he had used to work as a receptionist. The first thing he did was push through a raise for everybody working there. The second thing he did was buy a condo the first nice place he'd lived since college, with landscaping and a fitness center in Linda, his neighbor, hatefully nearby on his many nights alone. His loneliness was just one more grudge he held against God, along with the usual ones. Mitch often thought of a woman he'd counseled, whose 24-year-old son had hanged himself after writing a vicious suicide note that blamed every unhappiness of his life on his mother. Mitch read the file before he met with her and braced himself for the volcano of guilt and anguish. Into his tiny office walked a pert woman, Nicely made up, with polished fingernails and an easy smile. It is so nice to meet you, she said, her voice drenched in Tennessee, maybe, or Georgia. I am terribly sorry for your loss, he said. She shook her head. Henry was unhappy. I'm afraid it was bound to happen. He'd never fit in well, she said. First he was too skinny and then too fat, and all the way through high school his complexion was a furious explosion of blemishes that no medicine could calm down. Girls didn't want to go out with him. Boys either. School bored him. He thought he was smarter than the teachers, she said. Maybe he was. When he got a job tending bar, she was pleased. People always liked their bartenders, but they didn't like Henry. They would toy with empty glasses for 10 minutes, waiting for another bartender to see them, sooner than ask Henry for a refill. At the end of his shift, every glass behind the bar shone. 
He memorized recipes for 18th century drinks that required gum syrup and juniper berries. When he asked girls for their phone numbers, they gave, them wrong, they gave him wrong numbers. He told you this? It was in the note. Mitch hadn't seen the note, but according to the file, Henry had written, if I'd had even a halfway decent mother, I might have had a chance, but instead I had you. It went on for seven pages. It's hard not to feel guilt when someone close to us commits suicide, Mitch said carefully. Henry had a hard time his whole life. When I told him that things would get better, he'd ask how I could be so sure, and I didn't have the answer for him. Who does? But the note, Mitch said, long, isn't it? His whole life, Henry tried to push blame onto other people. How do you keep the guilt off you, Mitch blurted. This woman might have the secret to happiness. <laughs> people ask that a lot. I love my boy, but he wasn't always in control of himself. And just because he said something doesn't make it true. You may be the smartest person I've ever met, Mitch said. You need to be seeing a better class of person. She laughed. He laughed. They chatted a little bit about people and reputations, and they parted cordially. Mitch let three weeks pass, and then he called to ask if she would like to talk some more, perhaps over a cup of coffee. I'm moving on, she said. Two days after that conversation, Mitch went to an animal shelter and brought home Riley. He remembered that Linda liked dogs, which didn't seem like a bad thing to remember. Thank you.